Let's get into this word today. Uh, I, so we kicked this series off last week, and I love the name of this series. Some of you all struggle to say this. Some of y'all don't have a bit of problem saying it. But I need you to turn to three folk and tell them, kiss my grits. Just, just, just tell somebody, kiss my grits. Just, just as, as sincere as you can be, say it in Spanish, say it in whatever language, just kiss my grits. How do you say that in Spanish? Besame me, gritos. Oh no, there we go. I, I know, that's bad, that's bad. I'm so sorry, I shouldn't even go on there. So here, this series is all about this. This, this series, I'm sorry, welcome to Free Life. This, this series is, is about us finding the grit in our life. Not rolling over, not being soft, not just taking life because that's what it gave, but getting a pushback. Getting something where I'm not, I'm not, I'm not a, a, a welcome mat for life to wipe its feet on. I'm going to stand, I'm going to push back, but it's, it's not that I've got this attitude. It's a spiritual grit that rises up. Something spiritually that empowers me to where Christ living in me makes me strong. And I stop living my life on the defense and I go on the offense. I'm not just trying to keep my blessing. I'm going for more. How many of you want more in life? Anybody else want more in life? Please raise your hand. That's not a trick question because if you don't want more, I'll take mine and yours, all right? So I'm just saying, God has more for your life. Last week, we talked about patience, uh, being gritty. This week, I want us to talk about living with gritty confidence. How do you develop confidence? You see, confidence is a part of the grit. If you don't have confidence in what you know, then there's no grit. There's no pushback in your life. And I want to talk about that for a little bit today. I had to go this week and I had to get fingerprinted. I didn't do anything wrong. Uh, we were applying for some things at Excel Academy, our school back here, more than 400 students doing amazing. And, and uh, as being one of the leaders there, I had to go get fingerprinted for some things that we're applying for. And I, I tried to tell him who I was. I said, no, my name is Scott Thomas. Okay, we need to verify, please. Would you please roll your fingers? And so they, they did all that kind of stuff. They, they wanted to verify. They wouldn't just accept my word for it. Uh, but you've experienced the same thing. Have you been to the DMV before? Enough said right there, right? Right? I mean, just like that's one step above hell. That is just your, that DMV thing. Uh, like they want to, what's your name? We need your birth certificate. We need three forms of ID. We need to know uh, where you went to high school. We need to know you, you got bills in, in Lakeland. What was your teacher's first, your first teacher's pet's name? I mean, they, they want all this. Seriously? It's crazy. Why, why do they require all the verification? Because people lie about their names. When I go to Smoothie King, I put my order in some days, and who's this order for? Denzel. <laughs> some days I'm Rocky. You just never know who's going to bet. I mean, you, you could like, throw anything out there, right? But, 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 but they wanted to, watch this. They, they, they fingerprinted me because they wanted a higher authority to verify my identity. It wasn't just based on my word. Why do they do that? Because the unknown, the unverified creates insecurity in our life. You are insecure about things you don't know. We're insecure about every exam that we've not studied for. And all the students said, amen, amen, right? So watch this. Spiritual confidence is built by, watch, verifying and experiencing God's word for yourself. You've got to experience this for yourself. Don't live off of someone else's experience. Don't just live off of someone else's testimony. Experience him for yourself. I, I, if I don't know and if I don't trust, if I don't know what God's word says, then I don't trust God's promises, then that unknown, watch this, it makes my faith insecure. I have enough faith to trust him. Okay, I'm saved. But then there's times that I question if I am saved because I've not verified what his word says. I don't have enough confidence yet. I, I live, my faith is shallow. Life happens, stuff goes crazy, and I don't pray and push back and start declaring the promises of God. I just take life as it comes and thinks, well, I just got to white knuckle it until this thing is over with. And there's some things you're putting up with now that you have authority to run right over top of. When our faith gets gritty, we get a pushback and we get a, oh, I don't think so. Oh, I'm going to tell you something. And all of a sudden now something new comes out of your life, right, whenever you realize, I don't have to put up with this. Would you tell somebody, I don't have to put up with this. Just tell them, I do not have to put up with this stuff. That's right. We got to stop living with maybe faith. 
well, maybe he will, maybe he won't. Maybe he likes me, maybe he doesn't. Maybe I'm saved, maybe I'm not. We gotta stop living with that shallow, unconvinced, unverified maybe faith because if we do, we're never gonna stand, speak, fight, live. We're never gonna push back. And God has a plan to do that. In, in the Bible, we, we have this cool story of, in Acts chapter four where uh, these two guys, uh, Peter and John, uh, they were hanging out and, and, and they, they began to do things in the city that just upset the city. They're preaching about the goodness of Jesus and 5,000 people, according to the Bible, 5,000 people say yes to following Jesus. They buy in like he, he's the Messiah, let's go. And they turn their lives over. And then, then amidst all this going on, then they go and pray for this guy who had been lame for a long time like he couldn't walk. And now he's up and he's walking and the whole city's going crazy because they knew about the guy and now he's got all this attention. And the religious elite got really jacked up and upset with these two guys because of their preaching. People get uh, accepting Christ and now they're, they're they're healing people and they're going crazy. So they arrested them. They arrested them, like, shut them down. And they pulled them in, they arrested them. And, and when they shut them down and arrested them, uh, they came back around. And then this religious elite group, this Sanhedrin group, they're talking about Peter and John in this verse. And listen to what they said about them. Acts chapter 4, verse 13. It says, when they saw the courage, they mean these religious elite, when they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished and they took note that these men had been with Jesus. I, I, I love this, I love this verse because it says that their courage was visible when they saw their courage. I wonder what that looked like. Have you ever seen somebody who was just bold and courageous? They just kind of, hmm. What, what, you want a piece of meat? <laughs> I mean, like, like, really, like, they, they got this edge on them. It's like my mama. When, when I was younger, man, I'd be, going, I'd be going through some stuff in my life. Like, mama, I need you to pray about something. How many of y'all have a mama or a grandmama or a friend or an adopted mama or an auntie that when you hit some hell, you know who to pray? You, you, you know who to call. They're going to pray for it, right? My mama, all my life, she had that PhD, that, that, that Pentecostal hairdo, like stacked up really high, you know. And, 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 and man, when, when it came time, we could be, she would be so nice. Oh, she just baked a cake, and she's got lasagna in the oven. It's all good. And just, just, so, just, just a, a little apron and, and all just, just, so, just so sweet. And mom, this is going on in my life. Oh, tell what is going on, Scott? What we got? And all of a sudden, like this beast woman comes out in my mama, and like this, this, this fire and rises. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. You just kind of back down. My mom was the kind of mom that I would, I, I would walk down the hallway of my house, and I could look in her bedroom. She had this big Bible that she would put on the floor. She would stand on top of the Bible. God, I'm standing on your word for my kids. I'm standing on every promise for our house. You're opening doors for, and I could hear my mama praying over me. How many of you know you did not want to come to my house jacked up, sin in your life, anything crazy going on? Because as soon as you walked down the hallway, you ran into Jesus Jr. at the end of the hallway. Man. But let me tell you what, I had a confidence in my mom's prayer and walk with Jesus who she knew him to be, and it brought confidence to me. That's what, that's what Peter and John had. They had a confidence that was visible. These guys know what they're talking about. But look, why? It says, because these men had been with Jesus. You see, the more time we spend with Jesus, our confidence begins to grow. I'm more convinced of who he is than I am my circumstances. I'm more convinced of his ability than my trouble. I become more convinced of his promise than my problem. I, it changes everything when I get my eyes on him. I want to talk to you today for the next couple of minutes on how do I build gritty confidence? Well, I, how can I have that thing that whenever stuff hits, like I, boun I bounce off the back wall and go, all right, it's on. Oh, I'm going to go karate kid. Right now. I, I'm not just going to take it and run. I'm pushing back. I'm coming back at this thing. I'm holding my ground. How do we do that? Number one, there's just two points. So, so watch this. Number one, we've got to believe God's word. 
If you're going to have gritty confidence, now I know that doesn't sound deep, but just chill and hang with me for a minute. All right, so we've got to believe God's word. The Barna Institute, the Barna Institute is a, is, a, is a group that does major studies and surveys and runs polls and, and research all across the nation, especially related to people's faith in America today at large. And in Barna, uh, the Barna Institute in 2016 did a study, and here's what they said. 59% of Christians believe that the Bible is absolute truth, telling us 40% of Christians do not believe the Bible is absolute truth. 40% of people who say that they have trusted Jesus with their life do not believe that everything in this book is true. My next question to those people is, which parts are true and which part is a lie? Who decides? Who gets to determine what's right and wrong in this book? It's, it's, it's a very slippery slope. And, and let me put it this way. Let me get, this will give you a perspective. Here's, here's how that percentage would play out in our lives. I am 60% sure that this plan I'm on is not going to crash. I'm not getting on that plane, all right? I'm just, but if, but if, if you can be 60% sure about it, you go for it, Slick. That's all good. I'm 60% sure that this taco is not going to give me food poisoning. I'm 60% sure. I'm 60% sure that my spouse is not having an affair. Did you all hear that amen from the front row? I understood it in English, in Spanish, in Hebrew. I understood all that right there. Yep. I'm 60% sure God's not a liar. I'm 60% sure he doesn't lie. You see, that's going to create a challenge. Why should I trust God's word to lead my life? Well, let me ask you another question. If not God, then who? Wait, 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 wait. I, I got some, I have some suggestions. Religion could lead your life. Culture could lead your life. Politics could determine for you. Well, that's how my party votes, so that's now what I believe. Okay, good for you. Just tell me how that works for you. People, family, opinions, you, me, thinking we have the ability to determine for our own lives. Oh, it sounds real sexy, but let me tell you what, it's deceptive at the same time because you see the moment that there are multiple standards that we can live by that means there's absolutely no standard to live by because a standard by definition is a fixed rule of measurement it's fixed it doesn't move it you, you can't shake it it is what like it or not it doesn't matter obey it or not it doesn't matter it's there that's why we have in our nation called the gold standard the gold standard tells us that this is the value of gold today, and based on the value of gold, that makes your dollar worth this much. But we don't get to determine in our own homes, our own business, how much that gold is worth. We don't get to determine that. It's already been set. We don't get to vote on that. It's, it's predetermined. It is established. It's solid. It is what it is. You see, without that standard, we would have prices and numbers all over the place and nothing would work. When you throw the standard away, you immediately interject chaos. When the standard of marriage gets thrown away, God's idea, chaos hits everything. When we start redefining God's words, God's policy, God's principle, when I think I have the capacity to redefine God's original meaning of this and I begin to put my own definition to it, I have literally pulled the foundation out from underneath the house and everything begins to collapse. You can't mess with the standard. You see, God's word is the only foundation for life. It is the only, it's not a foundation, it's the only foundation for life. The Bible says heaven and earth will pass away, but my word shall remain forever. It's a standard. The Bible says all scripture is God-breathed, and it's, uh, it's, it's profitable for you and I to live our lives by. See, the culture does this. Culture hates the idea of absolute truth. You're not going to tell me how to live. You can't judge me. That might be your way, but not my way. Okay, that's all good. And I'm not saying my way is right. I'm saying his way is right. Yeah, but, 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 but yeah, yeah, yeah. 
But culture will tell you, I decide my own truth. I'm going to be true to me. I got my truth. You see that? There's a, there's a new concept going on, new phraseology going on in culture today. It's called your truth. We'll just tell your truth. Oh, and by the way, your truth. And by the way, your truth. Well, listen to me. By definition, then your truth and your truth, somebody's out of order. Because you can't have two different truths. There's either there's a truth, there's not different, multiple truths. And we have to be very careful. It's a slippery slope that we can get caught on. Proverbs 21 tells us this. A person thinks that everything he does is right. But the Lord weighs the heart. You see, let me put it this way for you. Maybe this will help you. There are folks today that say they hate religion. Organized, man-made rules. Have you ever, anybody ever have legalism try to be pushed on you? You can't do this, you can't do that, you can't do this, you can't do that. Religion. The culture laughs at, mocks, and scorns religion. By the way, for Free Life Chapel, in case you're first time here, we don't like religion either. Relationship, yes. Religion, no. Man-made rules, horrible. But watch this. Religion is one concept of a truth, how to live your life. It's, it's a standard that is set by the church. But the culture also has its own standard. The culture is telling you what's right and what's wrong. And if you don't believe what culture says, they will shame you and mock you publicly for not believing what they believe. So watch this. To say that you hate religion but embrace culture makes us a hypocrite. Because both are man-made. Both are man-made. Culture is just as guilty as religion, and religion is just as guilty as culture. You can't choose one and not the other, and all of a sudden think you're living at a higher level. Well, I'm just more enlightened. And since everyone believes it, can I tell you something? Popularity has never made everything all right. First Corinthians chapter 4 says this. Here's a good one. My conscience is clear, but that does not make me innocent. Today, culture will tell you, as long as it feels good, as long as you don't hurt nobody else, you can do what you want with what you want. And ladies and gentlemen, let me tell you, that's a slippery slope. It's a seductive lie. It feels good, but it brings damnation to your heart and your life. It will wreck your house. It will wreck your mind. That's like saying we're, we're going we're to turn the leadership of the entire world over to children. Of course, they, they kind of are right now, but anyway. But we're going we're gonna to turn the whole world over to kids get to run the world. And the kids set up, that's great. No more naps. No more nap time. And no more broccoli. The broccoli has got to go. Give it away. Get, get no more. And no more scheduled potty breaks. We're tired of being marched down the hallway, holding our neighbor's hand and forced into that little room with little midget toilets. We're tired of this. And then we wonder why everyone in our world is cranky, unhealthy, and their lives are a stinking mess. Because we've got children with juvenile minds running the culture, making up rules based on their feelings, not based on a standard that will carry you through anything you face in your life. The Word of God. The Bible says this in John 6, God's Word is life. It's not taking from me, it's pouring into me. I get better because I'm doing it God's way. I'm not losing out. I get better at doing it that way. When we, when we believe God's word, we, confidence begins to grow based on God's word. And we live strong and we walk in victory day in and day out. Our faith gets gritty when we are convinced that this book is true. Can I remind you, where God has an opinion, mine is irrelevant. What God said is what will stand. We have to believe that. When I was in, grew up in, I grew up in Virginia, and uh, during the wintertime, I mean, it got cold in Virginia, and, and my uncle had a 90-acre farm, and out on this farm, he had this little pond, and, uh, and we, we, we fished in it all during the, the summertime, but in the wintertime, when it's fro frozen over, well, you go out there, and you run up and down, and you slide and everything, you try to ride your bicycle across it and fall down, but, but before we could get on the ice, we had to check and make sure it was going to be solid enough. To, to get on, and so there was this little tree that was by the, by the, by the, by the pond, and so as kids, we would, we would hold on to this limb, and we'd start, and then you'd move out the limb a little bit, and just kind of hold on, and, and you're, and you could hear the, the ice moving a little bit, and, and once, it, once, once we knew, we'd, we didn't punch a hole through it if we could, and once we saw how thick it was, then we could go play on it, but, but man, at first, we were insecure in the strength of the ice, 
to hold us, and because we were insecure, we didn't put our full weight on it. Uh, let me help you with this. If you don't believe in the strength of God's word, you won't put your full weight on his life. And you'll keep trying to do life your way and his way, my way and his way. I'll do me until I hit some hell, then I'm going to call on Jesus, come bail me out. Okay, thank you, I'm back to me now. And that's why life seems so up and down and back and forth, because I'm, I'm picking apart. I'm working the 60% that I think is good, you know, the 40%, I'll take care of what God got wrong. And that's the mindset that begins to break our life down. I've got good news for you. He, uh, God has been able to hold my full weight, and he'll hold yours too, I promise you. He's faithful to his word. Romans chapter 10, those who put their confidence in God will never be ashamed. Here's one in Philippians, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to the completion until the day of Christ Jesus. In other words, what you're looking at right now, I'm not a finished product. I got a long way to go. What you're sitting beside right now is not a finished product, but take confidence in the fact that God's not bailed on you. He's still working some things out. You're getting better all the time. Don't stop now. Have confidence. It's working. This is what he's saying to take confidence in, to lean into him. You see, our faith gets gritty when our confidence in God's word grows. And man, once you begin to understand, you begin to read it, you begin to hear it, you begin to believe what God's word says, now you've got to fight inside of you. So when things come your way that don't match with what his word says, you use this reality to fight that experience. And I push back based on the word of God tells me. The, 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 the biggest way that, you used to, that we use to fight back is when I start quoting God's word. It's Instead of saying how I feel, if I start saying, well, here's what I think or here's what I feel, I'm fighting with the wrong thing. But whenever life hits me, the word of God says that by his stripes I am healed. And I fight with the word. God says he will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on him. The Bible tells me no weapon formed against me is going to prosper. Every tongue that rises against me in judgment, it will be condemned. Uh, the Bible tells me a thousand will fall by my side, 10,000 by my right hand but it's not coming to my house. I've got the word of God I stand on to give a confidence to my faith. I can push back. I'm gritty. Someone shout, get gritty with it. Get gritty with it. Get gritty with it. Yes. Push back. I'm trying. I like that. I like that. Proverbs 28 says this. I love this. The righteous are as bold as a lion. Everyone going, Arr. that's embarrassing. Don't do that ever again. Don't ever do that again. <laughs> so watch this. Number one, how do I build confidence? I've got to believe what he said. This has to be more of a reality than my feelings, more of a reality than my experience. Number two, I've got to follow God's word. I, I, I need to believe that this is the word of God. But now I've got to follow it. Now I know, I know that's it. Well, duh. No, but, but don't, don't, don't get it twisted. Because I know what it is to believe that God's word is this, but not to follow it up in my life. I know what that's like. And I bring it out for an intention, for, for a reason. I was driving to, to church this morning early. Coming down the road, I was sipping on a cup of coffee. Had my Kirk Franklin radio station playing on. And just, just enjoying life and bopping down the road. And all of a sudden, I look at my rear view mirror, and there was a police officer. following right behind me. <laughs> hey, man. How, how many besides me, anybody else suck air twice when you see a... <gasps> yeah, just like that. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? <laughs> Some of y'all are way too safe for me, man. Y'all can't keep it real. <laughs> so I, I did what you do. I looked at my rearview mirror, and then I looked at my speedometer. I was driving the speed limit, y'all. Can you give me a hand clap for that? Because one time, I'm like, thank you. I, I'm feeling pretty good. I, I did it. <laughs> Seatbelt, everything. I mean, I had it all going on. All of a sudden, when I saw him, I went from <gasps> to, I got this. Come on, Kirk, play that thing. My, that's what I, no, that's when I'm over the speed limit, Maria. That's what I pray at that point, yeah. Here, Here's, here's what I want you to know. Because I was following the standard, 
the limit, I had a confidence that nothing could stop me. I'm good. I can keep driving. Everything's going to be. Our obedience to God's word builds a confidence. I've got this thing inside of me. I ain't cussed this week. I did not go off on anybody this week. It's been a good week. It's been a good week. I read a devotional on a TV program that came across the screen. It's been a good week. I called my mama. We said amen after our wedding. We got finished. I prayed over my food this week. It's been a good week. You, whenever you have engaged and leaned in spiritually and you see your life practicing, not just believing, but practicing this word, and you held your peace. Uh, anybody this week have, have opportunity to go off, but instead you kept your patience this week? You, uh, patience, 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 right? When, when you came out the other side, you came out the other side, and I didn't go off, I did Man, heaven's going, yeah, baby. And you're going, I did it, I did it. <laughs> It builds your confidence knowing I'm doing this thing. I'm walking this thing out. And so I want you to understand your obedience builds a momentum. It raises confidence in what God's word says. But I want to show you in the closing moments. I've got to read this verse to you. First John chapter 3. I love these verses. I'm going to read this fast. And then I'm going to say a couple things. I'm going to get you out of here. So watch how this goes down. Ready? This is how we know. I'm sorry. My, my ADD. I'm thinking, this is how we do it. So, uh, yeah, this, <laughs> sorry. This is how we know that we belong to the truth. And how we, look at this, set our hearts at rest. Does anybody like the idea of your heart being at rest? I know I'm not jacked up with God. There's nothing between us. It's all good in the neighborhood, right? Set our hearts at rest in his presence. If our hearts condemn us, we know that God is greater than our hearts. He knows everything. Watch this. Dear friends, if our hearts do not condemn us, we have confidence before God and receive from him anything we ask because we keep his commands and do what pleases him. Let me finish with this right here. You need to understand, I know this from, from experience. When I've not been living my life the way I should, I love God. I'm not mad at God. I believe his word. But I was trying to, my way, me and Frank, right? We're trying to do our own thing, our way. It doesn't work. And what happens is when I start to hit some difficult times, I condemn myself because I know. No one has to tell me I'm wrong. I know. Anybody else in this room identified? When you're, when you're jacked up, no one has to tell you, identify it, point it out. You, you know, you know, like, dang it, bad weekend, bah, bad day. I should have said that. Yeah. We know, we know. Watch this. And what happens is now we self-condemn. Right. Watch this. I love Jesus. I gave him my heart. But now I'm condemning me. When you are a Christian, don't miss this. The only condemnation you'll ever experience is condemnation you put on yourself. Yeah. The Bible says there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Jesus will never condemn you. We condemn ourselves because we know better. No, we know better. We know, we know better. And when I condemn myself, here's what happens. I make my life so heavy and I push back on God. The Bible says, when I condemn myself, God is greater and he loves me and he's waiting on me to get over me. My life isn't moving. He's saying, Scott, get up. Would you believe this? Can we walk this thing out together? Because as long as you stay in that pity party and keep condemning yourself, we're not going any further. Your confidence is gone. You don't believe that I'm good. You don't believe I love you. You don't believe I can fix this. You don't believe I can. I'm here for you. People bailed on you. I'm still here. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. When I self-condemn, I literally put my life on pause. When my heart doesn't condemn me, when I'm living the best I can, and I feel like there's momentum in my life, I feel like I'm really, truly applying this. I'm, I'm reading this. I'm coming to church. I'm doing the best I can to change some things. I'm not changing overnight, but man, I'm further down the road than what I ever was. When I get that momentum going, now there's no condemnation in my heart. And the Bible says now heaven's open and prayers are answered left and right in my life. What's the difference? Self-condemnation versus confidence. 
You see, when I'm confident, it's not that I have earned a right to receive from God because we can't earn any of his blessings. That's called self-righteousness. We're not self-righteous. But I live, I declare, I believe, I see through different eyes. I've got a momentum in my life. I'm pushing back. I'm getting my hands on things that I never would have had. If I'm self-condemned, it drained my joy and my fight. But when I've got confidence, it makes me reach and believe for more in life. And I declare God's word. And when that happens, all of a sudden, boom, doors open. Prayers are being answered. Left and right, it pours into my life. It's critical that we don't live in self-condemnation. It's crit- How do I avoid that? I follow God's word. I live in obedience to God's word because obedience brings momentum. So believe God's word. Believe that you're forgiven. Believe his blessings. Believe that there's an order for your life. Believe that there's promises you can have. But then also follow God's word because obedience brings confidence. Let me close with this last verse, Hebrews 10, 35. This is a great one. This is a great one. Do not throw away your confidence. It will be richly rewarded. When I live with the confidence, reward and heaven and blessing and open doors and favor and increase keep coming at me. It's not because it's not available there. But because I'm self-condemning, I'm not seeing it. I'm turning my back and I'm more into me than I am him. But when I get over me and I embrace the word and I begin to walk the word, I begin to step up strong and I feel like all of heaven is smiling on my life. You can give yourself a break. You can take heaviness off of your life. I've learned this out of my own mistakes. If I just get my eyes back on him and off of me. And that's when he says, enter my throne, my presence boldly so that you can receive grace to help in your time of need. Walk in here with your head lifted high, shoulders square back when you're in a mess. I got you. I got you, boo. Come on, peanut. We got this. Let's go. Let's go. He's not mad at you. He's mad about you. We got to get the condemnation off. Believe his word. Follow his word. Watch your confidence grow. Get gritty. Start reaching forward. Watch God bless your life. Come on and stand to your feet. Come on and stand to your feet. You can live this life. Yeah, yeah, you can give Jesus a hand because Jesus makes all this possible. Jesus does this. Man. Your confidence will be richly rewarded. Confidence not in who you are. Confidence in who he is and what he said. Walk it out. Let's pray. Father, today, we just declare that we need more of you more of your mind and less of our mind. My attitude, my thoughts, me thinking that I can run my own life, I just wreck my life. But Lord, if I just just turn it over to you and decide to do it your way, you've already set the standard for my life. I'm not here to play with it. I'm not here to alter it to fit what feels good to me. I'm here to do it in a way that you've already described works. Today, God, bless my friends in this room, those watching online. Remind them, God, there's no condemnation in you. You love us with an everlasting love. And if we will get our eyes off of what's wrong in our life and get our eyes back on you, you're the only thing really that's right. You make life worth living. You bring joy and advance and favor that we can get in no other way. I'm not going to live trusting you only 60%. I've decided you deserve 100% of my life. I'm going to give you all of me, my marriage, my money, relationships, dating, school, career, health, business, private life, public life. You can have it all. I surrender it today. I'll do it your way. Today, God, let that be the prayer of our heart. Let that be the declaration in our spirit that God will get gritty and fight back and we can have everything you said is ours. Bless these folks here today, I pray. Give us gritty confidence in Jesus' name. Amen, amen, amen. If you receive that, put those hands together today.